you know, there are 27,649 buildings south of 96th Street. The average turnover of that stock at the end of the 1980s was 2.6%. The average turnover of that stock at the end of the 1990s was 2.6%. At the end of the 20 of the noughts, it was 2.6%. It's today, it's 2.6%. It has always reverted to the average. All right. So how's your week going? You ready to wrap it up? Yeah. So, you know, so, well, the week just continues into the weekend. So we just keep going. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, it's, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of research and, um, you know, I've seen <clears throat> you have, I mean, the lift of accomplish accomplishments are here, you know, but, you know, that's unusual that somebody has accomplished as much as you have. So today what I want to do, Bob, is really kind of get into the, to the mind of Bob Knackle, what sets him apart, why why you're still doing what you're doing, because I think it's, you know, it's important for people to understand um, this business and a lot of times why we do what we do. And, you know, most of us aren't going to achieve what you have, but you're still out there working, out working a lot of the newer people in the industry. And I mean, just a couple of your accomplishments, you've done 2,283 transactions in and around Manhattan, uh, 24 billion in uh, sales. Those are, that's tough. That's got to make you, if not the top broker in the United States, right up there. So well, I think, uh, Joe, thank you for that. I, I think that, uh, you know, certainly I, I know a couple of brokers that have done more dollar volume uh, for sure. Uh, but in terms of number of transactions, I, I have to think that's that's up there. And it's growing every week, the way it seems. So I'm watching your stuff on social and and what a job you're doing there now. You know, I didn't see much of you until this year. And now I see you everywhere. So um, kudos well, that's to you. All, that's that. all part of uh, kind of uh, to keep up. You know, I think the world is changing. And yeah. I will tell you that, you know, I feel very blessed that, I still love the business as much as I do. Um, you know, it's it's a job for me and it's also my hobby. Um, and I but I in some ways, I feel like given the nature of um, technology today, uh, given how AI is going to change the the whole industry, I kind of feel like I'm starting my career all over again. <laughs> Um, it is and going I kind to of started with the with the social media journey that yeah. for years I was like, oh, the social media stuff, what a waste of time. Why do people yeah. do that? And it's just been completely eye opening for me. Um, I, I, I really enjoy it. I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm uh, being exposed to opportunities and meeting people I never would have met but for social media. So I feel like I'm really starting my my journey all over again. I just happen to have a 40 year track record behind me <laughs> that's uh, going to help me, uh, you know, maybe get a little bit of a competitive advantage against uh, some of the other folks. But yeah, I agree. But the fact that you're open to it is something. And, and that's kind of what I want to dig into today, because you know, I've seen a good number of your videos and you're, we're always talking about everything you've accomplished, <clears throat> accomplished. but what I want to do, delve into a little bit is who's the man behind all that success and where did it come from? I'm really, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice this morning already. So um, can we kind of start, uh, where were you, where were you raised? I was raised in a, a small town in Northern New Jersey, Maywood, New Jersey in Bergen County uh only a population of about 14,000 people at the time and Maywood was so small we didn't even have our own high school I went to high school at Hackensack High uh <laughs> which was the high school for kids in Maywood Rochelle Park South Hackensack and Hackensack okay um, so went from a relatively small intermediate school to a very large high school and um yeah, but it was a small town uh right. small town upbringing but close, yeah. I'm guessing. Do you have a, come from a big family? No, it's relatively small. Yeah. Uh, one one older brother and my mom and dad, and you know, it was a relatively small family. Okay, and so you went through. You played sports in high school and then in college as well, correct? Yeah, I played baseball and basketball in high school. Uh, just baseball in college, okay. and sports was always a big part of the upbringing. I mean, had a group of friends. I, I had a group of seven friends that we went to kindergarten together that are still friendly and get together once a year to to play poker and reminisce. 
Um, but uh, we were always doing some kind of sport after school, whether it was baseball or basketball or um, uh, street hockey. We were big street hockey players back in oh, May. Yeah. And it was always doing something after school until the, the fire department would uh, blow the fire whistle at six o'clock. And that was the signal for all the kids to get, get home and have dinner. So oh, it was really? that kind of upbringing. Oh, well, that's really Mayberry like. Very cool. Exactly. I love hearing those stories. Um, then uh, where did you go off to college? You went to Wharton, correct? Went to the Wharton School at Penn, yeah. Uh, what, what did you take in college? Uh, I was an economics major, which, uh, again, is that's the the typical um, a typical path for Wharton kids. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I knew after my first summer, uh, I really was intrigued by real estate. You know, I got the summer job at Coldwell Banker, uh, initially dropping my resume off there because I thought it was a bank. I didn't want to get into real estate, but took the summer job, loved the summer job. Um, and um, it was really in my sophomore year, the thing that really pushed me over the edge towards wanting to get into real estate was uh, I was taking an entrepreneurial management class and we had a guest speaker and he was a guy who um, had come, he was a Wharton alum and he said, look, I was sitting in your seat 20 years ago, and I have to tell you something. You all want to be investment bankers. I was sitting in your seat. I wanted to be an investment banker. I sell dog food for a living, and I'm the happiest guy I know. <laughs> uh, and he said, I found something that I really love. And if you find something you love, you're really lucky. Don't think you have to go work on Wall Street to be happy and make a lot of money. If you're if you're happy with what you're doing and you're really passionate about it, you're going to make a lot of money because you'll be able to rise to the top of whatever industry you decide to get involved in. And that was really the the thing that kind of put me over the edge. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go for this real estate thing. And then I started taking every real estate class, real estate finance, real estate economics that that Wharton had available at the time. And back in the early 80s, there weren't a lot of those classes. I think there were only about six or seven. And there's probably 30 or 40 today. Um, but uh, back then I took uh, all that I could take. And although my my degree is a, a BS in economics, um, you know, I, I did uh, take as many real estate classes as I could. OK, now, the, are there any entrepreneurs in your family? Or are you kind of the first one Were your parents or your brother? You know, mom, mom was a housewife. Dad was uh, started his career uh, after getting out of the Navy as a science teacher. Uh, then he became a, a vice principal and then a principal of a high school in Northern Jersey and Mawa. Fortunately, not the high school that I went to. I was going to say, um, you had to tell the line then. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, no. We had uh, the the principal of our high school. His son was in my class and uh, that was not an easy thing. So I'm glad I wasn't a student at my dad's high school. Yeah, I can <clears> imagine <throat> that would be, that'd be pretty tough. The um, So you started working at Coal Banker. And did you like it right off the bat or did you struggle a little bit? How did, no, right, how right did right you off the bat, start? Right off the bat, I loved it. I, I mean, yeah. I was <clears throat> driving around Morris County, um, logging all the commercial properties into uh, what CB called at the time their data bank. Right. It was great at driving around, looking at buildings, taking at, estimating the square footage, writing down all the tenants. I absolutely loved that. I, I thought it was great. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed being in the office because we'd be out in the field writing information down. Uh, and then go back to the office to process stuff and, you know, hang out with the the folks a little bit. I occasionally would have lunch with some of the guys and just loved hearing the stories about deals and what they were doing and seemed like they was a really great bunch of people. They were having fun, enjoyed what they were doing. They were making good money. And yeah. uh, I was like, hey, this is a pretty cool industry. So my next summer I went back and I actually ran that summer internship program uh, for CB. And my third summer, uh, I got my New Jersey salesperson's license and I was an assistant to an industrial broker, a guy named Tom Mullaney, uh, who's still a good friend of mine. Uh, and I was showing industrial space to tenants out in Morris County that third summer. Oh, man. Now, the, I think we need to set it back a little bit because there was you didn't have computers at the time. You were doing everything on pen and paper. No, absolutely. And, you know, and I still, I'm still very much an analog guy. If you look at, you know, you, you follow me on social media, you see a lot of stuff about my Knackle map room. 
uh, that, that is completely analog. That entire room is, is analog. And while we do have uh, our pipeline information, our com com sale database and everything is is on the computer. The the map itself is not digitized. I won't digitize it. Right. Um, it can be manipulated uh, then, right? I, I appreciate the uh, the analog nature of it, and it it really has a um, you know a very uh, significant, almost overwhelming impact on folks when they get into that room because nobody's ever seen anything like it. Yeah, I'm going to touch. I want to touch on that in a little bit. But, you know, you're seeing the younger generation. I walked out of my Oh, you remember Ari. You met her at uh, CREI. I mm -hmm. walked out, walked by her office the other day, and she is in her office. And she has got, I don't know where she got it. She's taking business cards and putting them into a folder. So, like I said, what if we go back to 1980? Because she's saving these. She goes, no, I have them in my computer, too. But I just like to have these in case something would happen. I can always fall back to them. Um, but they're, you know, there's still a lot of the younger generation, I guess maybe they're writing notes in school. And so I'm finding they're seeing that there's, it's important to be doing that as well. Now, what were interest rates like when you started? Uh, well, I can tell you in the multifamily sector, the average cap rate uh, was about 12 and a half percent. And uh, lending rates were about 13. It was 1984. And we're complaining now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, the average... You know the ten year open this morning at uh, at four ninety seven, uh, and uh, you know that seems extraordinarily high to most folks who have been in the business for less than twelve years. Um, but I'll tell you, the average ten year Treasury over the last fifty years has been five point four percent, so we're still below average. Yeah, I mean, do you think <clears throat> so? We've been had all the lower interest rates for so long. Do you think it's you're going to start seeing investment sales loosen up here? I mean, we're down, what, 80 percent plus right now. Do you think we're going to see it start picking back up again as soon as everybody gets used to these high rates? Yeah, well, interestingly, and I, I can only use New York as a microcosm because that's the the world in which I, I live. And I, I don't really know anything about the markets outside New York. But I can tell you that, uh, interestingly, uh, using Manhattan as that that data set, um, you know, there are 27,649 buildings south of 96th Street. The average turnover of that stock at the end of the 1980s was 2.6%. The average turnover of that stock at the end of the 1990s was 2.6%. At the end of the 20, of, of the noughts, it was 2.6%. It's today, it's 2.6%. It has always reverted to the average. Mm -hmm. And um, what that t tells you is that it probably always will keep at that average. And we've been below trend going on seven years now that I believe that the volume of sales will pick back up. Uh, we are going through what really is a, an historic reset of value where we have several property types are selling on a price per square foot basis in New York now at the same level we saw 20, 25 years ago. I mean, it is really, really remarkable what is happening. Um, and so we're going through that reset. Whenever you have a big reset like that, the psychology of the market takes a while to get in tune with the fact that that's the new normal. But as soon as that sets in, um, you're going to start to see trading pick up again. I believe yeah. that we will revert towards the the average uh, and that the, the volume of sales will uh, be higher than 2.6% uh, in years moving forward. And, um, you know, that's just looking at, at history as a guide and feeling very confident that we'll, we'll get back there. What is your guesstimate on how long you think that's going to take? Do you think another year? I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, you know, volume starts to pick up sometime next year. I hope it's the first half of the year. Um, it might be the second half of the year, but I, I do sense that it will be at some point next year uh, where, you know, there have been a number of mortgages that have matured, uh, mortgages that basically you'd not be able to refinance for the same amount today. Uh, lenders have been, you know, pushing, pushing those maturity dates back, giving uh, one year extensions. Uh, I think they can do that once. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it in perpetuity. So, uh, at some point, um, uh, folks are going to have to deal with these issues. 
Uh, and I think that, you know, we're uh, the consensus amongst most of the folks I talk to that are active participants in the market believe that that will happen next year. Okay. Have you ever considered now? I, I, let me tell you why I'm asking is I've got some of our agents that are investment sales going, listen, I want to learn retail. I need to I need to keep money coming in. Have you ever considered switching asset classes? No, well, I, I've been actually a generalist almost my entire career. We, okay. when we started Massey Knackle, um, we did it based on a geographic specialization and you were assigned a neighborhood and you tried to sell every type of building in that neighborhood. Yeah. Um, some neighborhoods had more of one type of property than another, but you were a neighborhood specialist. And in an era where um, publicly available information was uh, relatively scant and, and not good quality, um, geographic specialization made a lot of sense, 1980s, 1990s. Today, I think product specialization is much more important. And within each product silo, uh, you have years where volume is going to be higher, years when volume is going to be lower. Uh, but I think it's important to maintain that expertise in one area and just uh, deal with the the slower times when you'll be able to make up for it during the good times. And clearly, this type of approach is much more feasible, much more doable in a very large, dense market. If you're in a smaller market, um, you almost by definition have to be a generalist because there's just not enough yeah. uh, work to to provide a, a good living, even with a, a robust market share. So I, I think it it, ex it depends to a great extent on the size of the market that you're in, the density of that market, what the ha historical turnover has been. Um, but I, I think it's important to stick to what you do best and not uh, have the grass is always greener theory bouncing around from product type to product type, because what you want to do is be able to say, hey, for, for X number of years, I've sold so many of these type of buildings. If you want to sell that type of building, you know, think of me and then you want to be top of mind with people. And to the extent you establish an expertise in a certain area, folks will continue to think of you all the time. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's I want to get back to your history here. I kind of pulled us away because I was loving to hear your your opinion on it with your your history. So now you were a Cobble banker and um, you got the bug to go out on your own. You and Paul Massey. Um, what what was that? How did you? What made you say, okay, I want to do this on my own? Well, we we got a little frustrated, truthfully, with okay. um, with uh, management at the company, okay. and they were great people. But you know, we were we were two kids right out of school. Uh, there are three other people in the investment sales division at the time, all of whom had 20 years of experience. We were supposed to be working on a territory system. But when one of those senior guys got a, a deal that involved some properties in our territory, it went to the boss and said, hey, we don't want to bring these kids in on this deal. Uh, forget about this system. And the boss backed them up. And we're like, hey, that's not fair. Yeah. So we um, we actually wanted to leave the company at the end of 1986. Um, and went down to Chemical Bank and talked to our banker and said, hey, we need a loan. Where do we sign up? And, you know, she laughed at us and said, well, you need to have a three year track record, start your company, have a three year track record, come back to us and we'll we'll talk to you about a, um, you know, a potential revolving credit line. Uh, we were dejected, went back to the office, spent two years saving up the money uh, to start the firm and then uh, left CB um, in November of 1988. Now, it was just you, Paul Massey, and an administrative assistant, right? That's right. How big an office did you guys start out at? Uh, 850 square foot sublet, three rooms, pink shag carpet, oh, uh, eight, 18 month sublet uh, from some guy named Barry. I forget his last name, but uh, on the 14th floor of 16 East 52nd Street. Uh, it was such an exciting time. Oh, I uh, bet. And actually, our our uh, secretary that we hired was our boss's secretary. <laughs> so oh, really? She uh, she wanted to come work with us, and so that was uh, probably a tough one for them to swallow. But uh, yeah. yeah, it started just the three of us in that office. How long did she work with you then? Oh, she was with us uh, probably for three or four years. Yeah. Um, she was fantastic, but uh, you know, she lived in Wall, New Jersey, which is. Uh, probably on a, a good day, not during the summer, 
uh, is probably an hour commute. And mm -hmm. on summer Fridays, it probably took her two and a half, three hours to get home. So um, <laughs> that uh, that commute ended up uh, creating a uh, an issue for her and she ended up leaving us. But uh, but then we hired uh, Christy Moyle to take her place. Christy was, I think, 18 at the time. Uh, and she was with us, uh, right up until the time we sold the business and uh, oh my God, was really? actually became a, a partner in the, in the company. Oh, I love to hear those stories. I love that. That's you, you'd love to hear how these employees have stuck with you and, and then been rewarded at the end. Um, so now you've got three people sitting in that office and you're trying to recruit with pink carpet. Um, you're trying to run your business. How did you manage all that? How did you manage handling your business every day plus recruiting. Yeah, Joe, I'll, I'll tell you, we um, we made so many mistakes and it, it would have behooved us to have spoken to a lot of senior people uh, and asked them questions. We, we unfortunately did a lot of things by trial and error and consequently mm -hmm. made thousands of mistakes. Uh, didn't make a lot of those mistakes twice, but it was uh, a lot of trial and error, a lot of errors. Uh, and, um, you know, we were recruiting, we actually hired our first sales salesman, uh, Ed Winslow, uh, shortly after we opened the doors, you know, we, we had achieved a, a pretty decent level of success at CB. And in fact, um, after two years, we were made the bosses of the investment sales group in New York. Um, and, uh, the company had folks from around the region and around the country come into New York to meet with us to find out how we were doing it. Cause you know, basically the company was, was uh, nationwide it started in California. So it was a West coast company that was growing East uh, hired these two kids right out of college and they're in the most competitive market in the world and they're kicking ass. And so they, they wanted new salespeople to come in and meet with us and, you know, how are you guys doing it? What are you doing? Why are you doing it that way? And one of the people who would come in uh, like once a month on a Saturday from the New Jersey office was Ed Winslow. Uh, and Ed and I developed a, uh, a great relationship. And I remember we, we left CB on uh, November 15th of 88. In the afternoon of the 15th, we get a call from Ed saying, hey, I understand you guys went out and opened your own shop. I want to come work with you. Uh, and one thing led to another. About a month later, he was our, our first hire as our, our first salesman. That's that's amazing. You know, it's it had to be tough out there recruiting when you're a small firm like that. Were you guys having to cut special deals or are you one of those guys that like this is the deal? You either like it or you don't. Um what path oh, yeah, that, I think one of the things that that we came to realize and one of the things that we were dissatisfied with at CB was that that they they we weren't adhering to the guidelines. Uh, so we said, you know, this is there's no special deals for anybody. This is the way the, the company works. If you are on board with it, great. If not, you know, we're not making a special deal for anyone. And we so we grew very slowly from from 1988 to uh, 2001, uh, we grew from the three of us to 21 people. Um, and then after 9-11, that was really an inflection point for the company. Um, we saw so many companies downsizing, uh, so many people being let go, great quality brokers, lawyers, bankers. And um, we said, you know what, New York is tough. We're going to bounce back from this. We're not going to get, uh, you know, annihilated like some people were were scared about. Uh, and we hired a director of HR and went out and started hiring everybody. And we we were 21 people in September of 2001. Two years later, we had 150 people. Um, mm -hmm. And at that time, the market really started to take off mm -hmm. and we were well positioned. We had opened our Queens office in 1999, opened Brooklyn, I think, in 01 or 02. Um, and we were way ahead of the curve getting out to the outer boroughs. Um, that was a time where most of the Manhattan brokers didn't want to go work in the boroughs. We, we thought it was a, a target rich environment, yeah. uh, got out there. And then when it started to be cool to be in the boroughs, we were way ahead of the game with offices open had you know, robust sales forces in, in those neighborhoods. And, um, you know, that really was a, 
um, a, a very fortunate and, and lucky thing that, uh, you know, worked out for us the way it did. Yeah, it's having that foresight is it's very powerful. Now, did you guys use investor money or did you guys do this all on your own? No, no, all uh, all on our own. In fact, well, I shouldn't say all on our own. It was uh, the bank's money a lot of the mm-hmm. time because we were running the business on credit cards for several years, uh, especially with uh, during the SNL crisis. You know, there was oh, a point geez. at which our, our burn rate early on was about 15000 a month. Uh, we were at a point uh, in 1990, I think, or 91, where we had 15 grand in the bank, no deals under contract. We said, what do we do? Do we pay next month's bills and see what happens? Do we pay 5000 a month for three months and keep the lights on? Uh, we didn't really know what to do. We knew we had good credit, went around to banks, got a $2,000 credit card at this bank, a $4,000 credit card at that bank, got $60,000 in credit card lines in aggregate. So that ran the business for four months. And, um, you know, that was a couple of years we were in that boat and then had to uh, borrow money from uh, from uh, Paul's stepfather-in-law, who was a mortgage broker out in New Jersey um, and, uh, you know, made made it through those times. But, uh, you know, personally, I, I lived on credit cards from 1988 when we started the company until 1998, 10 years of seeing my network ba- net worth bounce around from uh, between zero and minus 180,000 because I had such good credit because of all the borrowing and made all the payments on time that I got my personal credit, I got up to 180 grand um, and just bounced around in that uh, in that bracket for for quite a while. But well, uh, definitely of- well, well worth it. We we yeah. had confidence that things would work out. And uh, uh, fortunately for us, it did. Let's kind of touch on that a little bit because a lot of people are going through tough times right now. If uh, I'm your next door neighbor and Bob says, "Hey, come over for dinner," and you're you know you're going through all this turmoil in your life, what are we going to talk about? How are we? Are you one of those that buries it? Does it talk about it? Or do you communicate about it? How do you handle those situations when you're 180 thousand in debt? And you know, walk us through your your mindset there. No, look, I I didn't didn't really talk about it at the time. I mean, you 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 know you have to face your uh, your reality. You know, it's like the Stockdale principle. Uh, Admiral James Stockdale. He was the the uh, Vietnam prisoner of war that was the highest ranking prisoner of war, and um, you know he just looked reality in the face, dealt with it every day. And uh, I think that's called the Stockdale principle is right. just realizing, you know, looking at, at your reality and um, facing it. And so we, we realized what was what every two weeks we had a, a meeting where we went over everything that we were doing, how were the finances, what was going on. And we just knew we, we always said, look, solve all our problems, go get more listings. And I ended every single sales meeting we ever had with, all right, go get more listings. Uh, yeah. Ask any of the guys that ever worked at Massey Knackle, any of the gals that ever worked at Massey Knackle, what did Bob say at the end of every meeting? Go get more listings. And um, that's what we did. And we kept getting listings. And, you know, fortunately, if you stick to um, to what you do, you have the discipline to do the things that need to get done every week, every day. Um, you know, things will will work out for you. And I think what I tell young people today who are upset about, you know, the way the market's going and things that are out of our control, I say, look, you can only control two things. You can control your effort and you can control your attitude. Work really hard. You can control your effort, work your butt off and have a good attitude, have a positive attitude about it. The, you know, be positive, don't be, be negative and keep doing that. And then on top of it, realize that the market always has been, is, and always will be cyclical and it will come back. The, I guarantee you it will come back. I don't know when it will come back, but I guarantee you it will. And if you, if you do that, if you can control your effort and your attitude uh, and those are in a good place. Uh, and you realize, hey, it's going to come back, that will keep you on course and you'll do the things you have to do to make it through the tough times. And that's why passion is such an important ingredient in the composition of a good salesperson, because that passion for the business, loving it, is what will give you the intestinal fortitude and the discipline 
to make it through those tough times. And no matter how good you are, um, you're going to have tough times. We, we've all been there. We've all been through it. Everybody's going to go through it. You could be the greatest salesperson on earth. You're going to have tough times sometimes um, through no fault of your own necessarily. It might just be the market or conditions, but there's always something you can do that you can control how hard you work, what you're working on, the way you're working, what you're doing, and can control your, your mindset, you know, be mm-hmm. positive about things. And I think that if, if you go in with that, that combination of ingredients, uh, everything probably is going to work out well for you. I agree. And I think it's also important to have the people around you, uh, supportive people around you. And I know you have a wife that's very supportive of you and, and, and daughter. And so that, that had to help a lot. I just, it would be, I got down to where I had $1,200 in, in the bank one time and it didn't bother me. I just knew it was going to, I mean, I knew that it was going to happen and I kept that positive mental attitude. And next thing you know, the contract came in and we were off and running, but you know, it's sometimes you just, you just have to stick with it and, and keep, keep going and try and stay positive. Now mm-hmm. you built uh Mackie, uh, <clears throat> Massey Knackle up to 250 agents, correct? Well, 250 total people. Okay. Uh, we were about 90 agents, I think. At okay. The time. 90 producers. Uh, the rest were support. Now, did you build the company to sell it or did you build it to run it? And then you just decided to sell it? No, it was the intention from the day we, we started to uh, build something that we could sell. Okay. Um, and, you know, neither of us came from uh, wealthy backgrounds. Um, so we just, we wanted to go out, uh, and we both loved doing, uh, doing what we were doing. We loved the business. We wanted to do the business, build the business, uh, change the way the market operated. We saw some inefficiencies in the market. We saw some things that, uh, we thought we could do better and, uh, wanted to create something that would have a lasting legacy, uh, and, uh, something that we loved and ultimately make money from it. Um, so it, it, selling was something that was always in the back of our minds. Um, but we also wanted to create something special along the way. And I'll tell you that as of today, um, there's at least 29 investment sales companies or divisions of companies in New York city, uh, that are either owned by or run by people who learn the investment sales brokerage business at Massey Knackle. And I, I'd say that that's probably my my proudest accomplishment. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, now, did you, you, you had thought about selling it at one point and then you pulled back, right? You decided to sell it at a later time? Well, we had, we had conversations uh, with a national company as far back as 2000. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, right before the dot-com bubble burst, um, we were looking for seven million at the time. They were offering six. They wouldn't come up. I remember the principal at that company saying, "Hey, we're making twenty five percent returns on our internet stock investments. Why are we going to pay more for you guys?" And you know, then the the dot com bubble burst. Um, and then oh uh, seven, uh, we had a fifty million dollar bid from uh, another uh, big global company. Um, and that didn't, uh, work out for a variety of reasons, but, uh, what it did teach us is that when we did sell, uh, we'd be on five-year contracts with whoever bought us. So it was actually when that deal, uh, we knew that wasn't going to happen in 07, we decided, Hey, look, Paul's turning 55 in 2015. If in 2014, the market's good, let's think about selling because, people are going to perceive that those contracts will have more value if we're in our fifties during the five years than if we're in our 40 in our, in our eighties during the yeah. uh, the five years. So, you know, let's look in, at 2014. And so 2014 came along and the uh, market was rolling. Uh, we hired an investment bank and, you know, we're very, very lucky to, to get Cushion and Wakefield to buy us for a hundred million. Yeah. Now, how many offices did you have at that time, at the time of sale? Uh, we had three offices in New York and had kind of a satellite office in New Jersey. Okay. Uh, that was a relative startup uh, operation. Uh, but essentially, we had three offices in New York, Manhattan, um, Queens, and Brooklyn. 
Wow. But you kind of went with the, uh, you did a little different, right? And maybe commercial back then wasn't doing it this way, but you went with a residential kind of open an office here, hire a manager, or what was the process you guys did when you're opening offices? Yeah, we, we generally hired um, uh, someone to start the office. Uh, we hired our first hire in Queens was Tom Donovan, uh, who was a player coach. Um, our first hire in uh, Brooklyn was Tim King, uh, who was a player coach. Um, uh, after a while, we gravitated more towards having uh, paid management that were not player coaches. Uh, we did that for a variety of reasons. Um, but, um, you know, just started, you, you uh, find the right person and then uh, build the business around them. What did you look for in those people? We well, be the same thing we always looked for in, in top, top people. We looked for people who were passionate about real estate, people who were very competitive by nature, um, and people who you just really liked. Uh, folks that you, uh, you know, we, we told our HR people, and I think one of the things that led to the 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 culture that we had, another thing I'm very proud of, the, the culture that we had at the company um, if someone got married, there'd be 40 or 50 people from the company at the wedding. Uh, we had tw 20 uh, folks get a beach house together in the Hamptons for the summer. And we'd have four or five couples go on vacation to the Caribbean together. Um, and that stemmed from a philosophy of saying, look, we were looking for a variety of things in candidates coming to our shop. But we told HR, if after you've interviewed these folks, if you don't feel like you really have a good time going out and having lunch with them or going out and having a beer with them, you can't offer them a job. And so we we had a culture where everyone liked each other. We did a lot of social engagements, you know, a summer picnic, a bowling outing, a, you know, go to the movies. And uh, we, we basically, uh, for all of our events, we invited spouses, kids, pets, you you name it. Everybody knew everyone really well. The friendship's very, very deep. You know, we sold the company uh, nine years ago now. Last year, I was at a wedding. One of our guys got married and it was about 25 MK people there. So it's still those those friendships are still lasting uh, to this day and uh, are really a, uh, a an outcropping of a culture that promoted um, uh, a bunch of good people who liked each other, wanted to work with each other. Uh, our territory system uh, really promoted people working together. Um, and so, you know, everyone was competing to be the top salesperson in every office, but uh, you were also pulling for the guy sitting next to you or the gal sitting next to you as well and wanted to see them do just as well as you did. In a company culture, it has to come from top down, right? So you had to be living it yourself. And everybody can see it. And it just, it really, really works. The um, sale of the company, you sold it for a hundred million uh, and then on New Year's Eve, right? New Year's Eve of 2014. That's right. It must've been a hell of a party. <laughs> um, how did that affect you? Having that well, kind of money in the bank? Now? Yeah, you know, it was, um, it was interesting. It was um, a time of uh, pretty significant introspection. Uh, I said, okay, uh, you know, what do we do now? I couldn't retire, obviously, because I, I was on a five-year contract with Cushman. So I was going to continue to 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 do the brokerage business. But I did think, you know, what what do I really want? What are my objectives? What are my goals? Um, and I, I think it enabled me to um, have a work-life balance that was a little bit more towards uh, my ideal. Um, but it also made me realize that, um, you know, I'm not an investor. I'm not a developer. Uh, I don't play the stock market. I'm a real estate broker and yeah. I'm proud to say that I'm a salesman yeah. and heard, I sell yeah. buildings. I love selling buildings. I think I'm pretty good at it and I just want to keep doing it. And, uh, Joe, I will tell you that, you know, I really think that I've got another, um, 20, 25, 30 years in me. And that may sound crazy coming from a 61 year old guy. But like I said, I, I feel like I'm starting my career over. Um, it's a, it's a whole new 
game with with AI and the different technologies that are available. Um, and as long as God continues to give me good health, um, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. I absolutely love it. And uh, I feel lucky that, you know, you, you see great athletes and at, at some point uh, your physical capacity just breaks down and you can't keep going. Um, but I, I kind of feel like an athlete that has uh, achieve some, some great milestones, but I can keep going. So <laughs> I'm going to keep going. And, um, you know, every day is a, is a, a new and exciting day. I, I still love getting out of bed in the morning. I'm up at five o'clock every morning. I can't wait to hit the field and get out there and compete. Wow. And, uh, I am absolutely addicted to winning, uh, and the brokerage business, provides so many opportunities to win. You feel a, a rush of, of winning when you find out someone wants to sell a building and you you feel that rush when you pitch the never business. never goes away. <laughs> find out you got awarded the business and then when the deal goes under contract. I mean, there's so many great positive moments of feedback that you get from this business that I'm totally addicted to it. I love it. And uh, again, feel very, very lucky that I found a business that I enjoy as much as I do. You know, there were, when we were at the CREI Summit, you were just a couple tables away from me. And I noticed people have been in the business for 20 years or 10 years or even five years that come over and talk to you. And then uh, and you'd give them the time. And then somebody had been in the business for a minute. You know, they've been in the business for a month, two months, three months. You would sit and listen to them, too. And you'd give them advice. And, you know, I think that's, you know, so important for our industry. And so you sure as shit better stay in this industry as long as you can. I'll come back and prop you up if I have to. But, you know, I think it's so important to help this younger generation get into this industry. So, um, you know, Joe, I think that also is is part of a mindset. I think there are there are two main uh, perspectives that I think folks have. Yeah. Uh, and you can have a perspective that this business and life is a zero sum game and a win for you is a loss for me. Uh, or you can have an abundance mentality where you say, you know what, there's enough to go around for everybody. Uh, and certainly being in a market like New York, where there are 175,000 investment properties, uh, there's enough to go around for everybody here. That's so, shit, yeah, um, you've only done 2283. You got a long way to go. Long way to go. You, but, you um, better be not taking weekends off. That's right. So, you know, I, I, I think that if you have that mentality, it leads to uh, a much happier life. Uh, you know, you don't want to begrudge other people from having success. You certainly want to have as much success as you possibly can have. You want to win as much as you can, but don't begrudge the other the other guy or gal because you know what? It is enough to go around for everybody. And if you have that mentality, I think it just, um, it, it leads to a much happier life. I completely agree. Um, now, so let's, so you, you've you got your hundred million in the bank, you go back to work. Um, how did you, did it change you as like, you know, I'm going to do more or I'm happy with the level of work that I'm doing. Uh, did you step it up or did you, you seem like the person that went and just did more is what I'm guessing. You no, know, I think you're, you're always looking to, to kind of stay ahead. Right. So yeah. uh, I think that, you know, initially I was a very slow uh, adopter of technology. Um, a lot of folks were using email before I was using it. I was reluctant to use email. I, you know, other folks had a BlackBerry well way before I did. Um, but I, I've changed. Uh, I've changed with respect to that. Um, and now trying to get ahead of it. And a lot of it has to do with my broker coach, Rod Santamassimo, who uh, mm. is is one of my very best friends. We've been working together for over 12 years. Uh, if I work in this business for another 25 or 30 years, as long as he's still coaching, he'll be my coach. Um, and, you know, he has me really trying to be at the forefront of adopting new technologies now, rather than being behind the curve. I'm trying to be ahead of the curve. Uh, we're doing some really innovative and groundbreaking stuff with AI um, on my my uh, the, my map room. And uh, we're coming out with the NACA land index uh, soon to be a, uh, a land sales database going all the way back to 1984. And we're going to apply all kinds of macroeconomic data to that data set to look for predictive things within the economy that can give us some lead indicators of what was going to likely to happen in the yeah. land market. So just great stuff. And this is all totally exciting. 
You know, oh, it, yeah. it, it's exciting. The, 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 the creating the map uh, was an endeavor that took about 20, 220 hours in the field, uh, followed up with thousands of hours of research. But I now have a resource that nobody else has. And when I have clients come into that room and look at that, uh, it, it, it just feels great to be able to offer them something that can help their business in a way that no one else can offer them. Oh, uh, yeah. So that, you know, that's, that's kind of a, an exciting aspect of it. And that feels great. And, you know, why wouldn't you want to keep on doing that? Well, you, that gives you such a competitive advantage. I mean, there's a lot of things that you do. So you've got the map room now prior to the map room, your pitch uh, hit rate was around 26%, right? Well, yeah, for the, the uh, we track every single pitch. Yeah. I know how many a year I do. I know what every year what the the conversion ratio is. Over the course of my career, the average success rate was about twenty six percent. Yeah, and now you're at a hundred percent, right? When you use the map room. Well, so far nine nine, nine, nine? For nine so far. Yeah, so we'll see. But I think I it's... there'll be there'll be a loss in there, uh, of course. Enough, but the the it has dramatically changed the value proposition that I can offer to clients. And again, everything we do is all centered around helping the client. How can we get the client? I only represent sellers. So all I think about, how do I get the client a better price, more money, a better result? How do I do it quicker? How do I, how do I create a better uh, experience for the client? And the, the, ma the, the, the map room has allowed me to do that. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to competitive advantage. You're always looking for a way to do to do better. And, you know, the pandemic hit, everybody shut down. Nobody knew what was going to do. What did Bob do? Got his tennis shoes on, started walking around Manhattan, mapping it all out. Um, you know, can you walk us through that mindset? What what made you think, OK, this is going to be a great idea? Is it just something in you you knew was going to be something that was no, going to it it's, it's something I wanted to do for years. You know, right. well, development site sales have always been a very significant component of my practice. Um, in order to really evaluate a site properly and to come up with the right valuation, you have to look at the pipeline of new construction that the to-be-built building on the land you're selling is going to be competing with. So it, it, remarkably, there's very, very little uh, publicly available information on the new construction pipeline. The most robust set that exists, every residential company that sells condos uh, publishes a report. Those reports are all very, very different from each other. I read every one of those reports. I read other commercial brokers' reports to try to get a sense of what's going on in the market. Uh, the condo pipeline is something that there's a lot of information, but not consistent um, and on residential rentals, hotels, office space, very, very little publicly available information. And I said 10 years ago, I said, you know what? I want to go out and count every building. But of course, you're so busy. You have stuff going on. You're working on deals. Who has time to do that? And during the pandemic, I had, um, I, you know, we were told to go home on, I think, March 12th of 2020. Go, go home for a couple of weeks, let this blow over, and then everything will be okay. Uh, clearly that wasn't going to happen. I took my family right. up to the country house in Connecticut and uh, we left the city in kind of a rush because we had heard that they may be shutting the bridges and tunnels down to quarantine Manhattan. So we we got out of town very quickly, had to come back and get some stuff. So I, I get off the FDR drive and I'm driving through the east side and it's literally like a, a, a film set from a science fiction movie. Yeah. Uh, there's nobody walking around. There are no cars. Every store is closed. Like what the heck is going on? And I'm driving to my, my apartment and it occurred to me, I said, you know what, this would be the perfect time to get around Manhattan and count those buildings. So I called up my team. I said, Hey, make copies of the Sanborn map. We're going out to do some field work. Uh, I had my partner, John Hageman, uh, pick me up uh, the next week went to drove to point x got out of the car basically left the car in the middle of the street went out and walked around for a half hour got in the car went to point b got mm -hmm. out walked around for a half hour and we just did this for several months until we were done with the whole island of manhattan south of 96th street on the east side south of 110 on the west side and then taped the whole thing together uh, we were highlighting different types of opportunities with different colors 
and uh, taped it all together. Now the, the map is 24 feet long and 10 feet wide and has more information on it than you could ever imagine. So, uh, and then, you know, we spent literally thousands of hours doing research on everything that we identified out in the field. And the databases that we have now, the data sets are just really extraordinary. Um, you know, we have everything down to the square inch. And, um, you know, that is, again, putting us in a position to do a better job for our clients. And I think the clients are realizing that. And I think that's why the success rate uh, that we've had uh, pitching business uh, mm -hmm. in the map room is as high as it is. Yeah, well, you've created that competitive advantage for yourself and it's paying off. You also do a couple other things. Um, you develop a site book. It's about 250 pages, the development site book um, of every development you've done, correct? Well, almost everyone. Uh, yeah, we have, um, I don't know, I, I have one actually. Okay. Uh, th this book, which there is you go. Uh, the development site sales. And yeah. what we've done in here, and this is another thing that came out of the pandemic, was um, to uh, have the time to create this. But essentially uh, what we have for each of the development site sales, we have a before picture of what was there before, the new development, a little write up on the transaction, and then a testimonial from the client. So I go into a, a potential seller of a development site and I say, here, we'd like to see what we've done on the development site sale uh, front. And I mean, this is a extraordinarily compelling marketing piece that oh. um, we can use when we're we're pitching business. Absolutely. And you even on every deal that you do, you create a one page. And I think that is so important because you can go back down the, and you're doing it now. If people if you're not following Bob on Twitter, make sure you start following him. I'll actually I'll put all your social down below so they can find you. Because I think you bring such valuable information of your stories. Some of them pretty damn funny it's from funny from the eighties too. Um, but you know, historically, there's the information is is very very powerful. Yeah, um, no, and the one page case studies again. Ed Winslow, our first uh, Massey Knuckles salesperson, excuse me, has has taken what we did, and we didn't really know what to call it or or what we were doing, but essentially what we were doing. Uh, is something that uh, that is now called proof stacking. Yeah, uh, where you're you're through these one page case studies, you're demonstrating your capability, uh, and you're constantly, you know, very regularly sending out this information to your potential uh, client base, and you're you're stacking that proof every week, every month, every year, uh, and after a while, the cumulative effect of that has a very significant impact on folks. You know, Ed, Ed refers to the um, the potential client as a doubter. Uh, and what you're doing by using the one page case studies and implementing the proof stacking is you're reducing their doubt. So you're reducing uncertainty. You're, you're creating um, a, uh, a reputation as being someone that has been there, done that, helped many other people, can help you too. Uh, and that converts the doubter to a buyer. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all it all works. And the fact that you you know at your level you're still doing this stuff and coming up with ways to to really continue to grow your business, that's a mindset that I think a lot of people really need to be in. You know, right? Especially right now. Say, what can I be doing next that's really going to help my business? And so now, how big of a team do you have now, Bob? Um, I have about uh, nine people, nine people. Uh, that work uh, directly uh, for me and with me. Um, and then my private capital group in New York uh, that I run for JLL has about 28, 29 people in it. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a great bunch. Most of those folks uh, were with me at MK. So, uh, you know, all of the producers I've been working with for over 20 years, John Hageman, my partner, has been my partner for more than 20 years. Uh, and it's great. Again, a, an outcropping of the culture that we had. We're all really good friends and uh, we love working together. Oh, that's awesome. It's, it's great to be around people that you really want to be around every day. That's what we're doing with our company is I'm in the office every day. So I'm hiring people that I want to be around. I mean, more often than not, we have lunch together in the conference room every day. So, you know, I think we had a lot of similarities the way we're setting these companies up, but um how is your prospecting evolving now? 
what is your, I know you're working on AI. Yeah, but the prospecting, what I've done is I've, I've kind of taken it to another level where, um, you know, I've always had a, a prospect list and would go through that and, and contact people. Uh, I now have, for, for instance, one segment of my prospecting deals with development sites in Manhattan. And the uh, development sites in Manhattan, I, I've identified on the map 649 development sites that I'm, I'm contacting the owners of trying to get hired to sell. Uh, I have actually prioritized those um, from number one to number 649. Uh, my objective is to speak to each of those owners once a quarter. Uh, I go through the list starting at number one, get down. If I get through all 649, I go back to number one and start over. If I get to the end of the quarter and I've hit 527, first day of the next quarter, I go back to number one. And that way I'm making sure I'm hitting all of my top priority prospects uh, definitely once every quarter. And that that is a way that I've fine-tuned the way that I do my prospecting. Yeah. Well, you're doing a lot of public speaking now too, right? Yeah, always have. Uh, oh, I think you? that's okay. important. You know, it's if you follow me on social media, you know, one of my, uh, my things is I, I think it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Yeah. Uh, and so speaking in public is a great way to uh, to get people to know you. Um, so it, it also it makes you uh, understand the market very well. I try when I speak in public, I try not to use notes. So I have to memorize stuff. So I'm constantly looking at statistics, memorizing them. Uh, and then you you write that speech, you give the speech. But then you have a whole host of talking points that you can use on all of your calls for the next month. Um, so, um, you know, speaking in public has always been a, a big part of what I, I try to do. Yeah. Well, uh, you're good at it. I've watched you now a couple of times. So, uh, are there any special tools that uh, you can recommend that you're using that you think would really help somebody in our industry that's starting out? Well, I think the number one tool and people don't think of it as a tool is self-discipline. Uh, yeah. I think self-discipline is not something you have. It's yeah. something you use. Uh, everybody has the potential to be self-disciplined. It, it should be viewed as a tool that you use. Um, and then I think another great tool, I think you got to have a coach uh, yeah. because no matter how self-disciplined you are, how often you try to use self-discipline, everyone can use some help in that area. And I think that's one of the things that I really love about the work that I do with Rod is he he gives me a another layer of discipline that I, I wouldn't have on my own. I think I'm a, a pretty self-disciplined person, but, uh, you know, he really helps me um, attain a, a, a high level of discipline, which is great. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of what we do is is basically fundamental stuff. You want to become an expert in your your target market, whatever, however you define your target market, you want to be an expert. So I think a lot of the the best tools to use are just setting time aside to study the market, really understand it, be able yeah. to articulate what's happening in the market in a very uh, statistical way uh, so that you can explain what's happening and demonstrate that you are an expert in that field. Um, and to the extent you um, you are able to articulate that expertise, that will differentiate you from every other broker in your market. Uh, and that differentiation uh, creates a competitive advantage. And that's what we all want to try to achieve. Absolutely. And I agree with you. Rod sent him awesome out, but the speech he gave at CREI Summit on AI. Um, first of all, I am going to put Rod's connect, uh, contact information down below because I think you're right. He is he is really on top of his game. And so matter of fact, I should get him on here and <laughs> bend his ear a little bit about AI. But, you know, how do you think AI is going to uh, affect commercial real estate sales? Yeah, okay. well, I think AI uh, kind of has two uh, two main components. I think the first component is a kind of a, uh, a quantitative uh, in nature. And I think that's what you're seeing it being used for now. Uh, I think AI 2.0 is going to be qualitative. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do now with the AI applications that I'm using on my land index. Uh, I'm trying to get some qualitative um, uh, uh data out of it. Um, but I think it, it's going to change the way things are done. You know, a, a company that used to have to have 100 people could probably do the same uh, uh, volume, the same amount 
of work with uh, with 20 or 25 people. Uh, I think it's going to reduce the uh, reliance on big companies. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you, a, a, an individual is going to have the same relative horsepower uh, given what AI will be able to do for them. Uh, and so I think it's, I think the, the whole nature of the commercial brokerage world uh, is going to change very dramatically uh, over the next five, 10, 15 years. And it's so changing trying, so to, quickly. trying to, trying to stay ahead uh, <laughs> of that. And I, yeah. I think the, the early adopters uh, will be in a, a better position than the folks who are, are not early adopters. So just trying to stay ahead. Yeah. Uh, now you were writing an article articles before. Are you still writing articles? No, oh, all the time. Okay. I, do you I use ChatGPT or do you just No, you never. I, I have not used ChatGPT. I, I hear a lot of great things about it, but I have yeah. not used it yet. I, I need to get around to doing that. But um no, my articles generally my, the uh, column I write for the observer, which is called Concrete Thoughts, is generally about seven hundred and fifty words. Uh, I come up with uh, three main themes that are going to be discussed in the article and do about 250 words on each of those themes. And, you know, I'm able to to bang those out in about 45 minutes or so. So it doesn't take up a lot of time, but I think it's a good, it's another way to stay in front of a larger audience of people. And, you know, those articles appear uh, in the, um, the Commercial Observer newspaper, uh, also, they're on the online version for the sure. commercial server. So I get a lot of, of mileage out of those. Yeah, I think if, you know, anybody listening to this, you should be writing a blog too, right? Or they should be writing a blog, not you, Bob, but they should be writing a blog. Because I know for our company, a, a good blog is one of the biggest drivers to our website. You know, so I think it's very important. Plus, it makes you really understand every aspect of your industry if you're writing about it. But um, all right. Well, what do you think? Let's. I'm going to. I got a couple questions for you for some Seinfeld trivia. Uh oh. Which, which, uh -oh. Let me tell you, Bob. That was a mistake because guess who doesn't know Seinfeld trivia? I'm like, well, that was stupid. I don't even know. So I'm on the phone last night going, hey, I got to email you some of these. Let me know. <laughs> but um, commercial real estate. Uh, this. Where are we going to be in the, in the by? You think we're going to be out of this recession by 2026? Oh, I think for sure, for yeah. sure by 26. I The only question that I might have is, will the office sector uh, be back on the upswing by then? I certainly hope so. Yeah. Uh, but I think the other sectors will be uh, turning the corner at some point next year. I think in, in, I in Manhattan, I think the retail sector has already started to turn the corner. Um, you know, we've had downward pressure exerted on retail rents for many years. I think rents have stopped going down, leasing activities picking up. So I think that sector has already turned the corner. I think the rest of the sectors will uh, will turn next year and uh, the office market may take a little longer. Uh, but that, and that's for B and C office. New construction class A office, I think, is doing really well. Yeah. Um, but uh, the other sectors are are facing some some Drug challenges. Down. Are you seeing uh, office conversions? Um. Certainly, there's a lot being talked about in that area. I think yeah. to have office to resi conversions, you need to have a tax abatement program to make it more economically viable. Uh, I think values in that secondary and tertiary office market are getting to the point where if they drop a little bit lower, um, the combination of the uh, value of the building per foot and the cost of demolition is going to be lower than land value. So I think we'll see a lot of older buildings demolished to make way for new construction. Um, so I think it's very interesting. It's very, going to be a very, very transformative period in the history of, of the city. Yeah, I'm going to go downtown LA this weekend. There's a couple of old office buildings they've converted to hotels. So um, they look nice in pictures. I want to go down and see them uh, in person. All right. So everybody listening, Bob's a big Seinfeld trivia buff. So I put out on my social yesterday, let's try and stump Bob, and I'm going to give a $50 gift certificate to uh, some of the people, or one of them that can. And so I've got two. Okay. All right, you ready? What actor played Elaine's father? What actor? I don't I don't know the uh, the name of the actor, but I know 
the, the actor's names I don't know, but I know oh, okay. it, that his name in the show was Alden Bennis. Uh, and he the book that he wrote was Fair Game. Oh, Christ. How often, how much time do you spend on this stuff, Bob? <laughs> okay, one last one. And I'll also <laughs> tell you, the, the episode that he appeared in, uh, he's in the hotel lobby uh, ordering drinks. Jerry and George got there ahead of Elaine. Elaine was delayed. They right. order a round of drinks. Uh, I'll tell you, Jerry ordered a cranberry juice with two limes. George ordered a uh, a club soda with no ice because don't you get more if there's no ice? And Alden ordered a scotch with plenty of ice. <laughs> okay. All right. One last one. Again, it's an actor, though. Who played Rusty the Homeless Guy? Uh, I don't know, but I know he was in two episodes and he was the homeless guy that actually took the rickshaw and uh ran off with it uh but uh and he played a, a homeless guy in another episode as well but i don't know the actor's name john grice i believe it was so yeah and the other guy was uh let me see lawrence tierney mm -hmm. all right you're the king i give all up right. Joe, great, great being with you, my friend. I look forward to seeing you in person again soon. You bet. And uh, I hope everyone gets something uh, out of this. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a great weekend. Take good care. You too, my Thank friend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.